let's get into it. So I do think perspective is worth 80 IQ points, so I want to make sure you understand mine. Uh, this is my and my team's, and I see some of my former team members like David Singh sitting in here. Uh, that's my entire career on one slide. Uh, all of my companies have been here in North Carolina, uh, working with a guy named David Smith. Anybody know who David Smith is? <laughs> yeah, a few people. Mark, Mark Sinis, another one of my colleagues. Uh, so David, and for those of you uh, uh, paying attention to computer game history, know your history. David Smith, right here in North Kakalaki, made the first real-time 3D adventure game called The Colony. Anybody? Look it up. So this was before Doom, before Quake, before Wolfenstein. It was the adventure game of the year on the PC, the Mac, and the Amiga, like 1987. Uh, Tom Clancy started playing that game. And the reason we have Red Storm Entertainment today, and the reason we created realistic tactical shooter games is because Tom and David formed a bond around uh, how, diff how ridiculously difficult uh, uh, the colony was. So anyway, that's uh, part of our background. We did game companies with Tom Clancy, Red Storm Entertainment, of course. That's our big hit. Uh, game companies with Michael Crichton, Douglas Adams, the science fiction writer. Any Douglas Adams fans out there like the universe and everything, right? Uh, and uh, Ozzy Osbourne, of those four who's still alive? Ozzy. Ozzy, 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 alive. Uh, yeah, so, and we've done a lot of work in the film industry, so working with this medium of 3D graphics, the reason I'm giving you this perspective is because, because of course, we're going to talk about AI and machine learning, and of course, that's, those of you who are working in games and in simulations know that a firm grasp of AI is incredibly important. If you're going to make convincing environments, convincing people, uh, you need a uh, uh, firm grasp of that. But what we're going to talk about today is the element of surprise that happened when all of a sudden machine learning really came into its own. Uh, I'm, not, I'm just going to tell you my personal story and how we're applying it to this issue of how do you actually take data exhaust or raw data and make models of human behavior out of it, and what do you do with it? What can you do with it, both for good and for ill? And how do we wrestle with those issues? All right, sound good? Um, and I'll just say that uh, I, I created a company also called 3D Solve that started some of the early serious games efforts uh, back in 2001. Uh, that got acquired by Lockheed Martin uh, in 2007. I spent six years there with my team, you know, working with AR, VR, AI stuff. That is where I discovered machine learning, and, uh, and uh, leads up to where we are today. And this is a general thought or a general theme before I talk briefly about machine learning. Is, uh, and that's the thesis of this company that I have here today, the triangle called Tonjo. It's this idea that every organization needs to be looking at every activity that they're doing, whether you're an institution of higher education, you're a bank, you're an insurance company, you're a government, um, and looking at all that activity and figuring out what should humans be doing and what should machines be doing. That is a critical thing to get right, that balance. Uh, I don't think we're yet at that point where machines just take over everything. I think there is a balance, but those who get it right are going to prosper. Those who don't are going to suffer and certainly not be competitive very soon. So just that's another sort of tweetable idea. Uh, but I'm, I'm really interested in this idea of superhumanism, like how do you uh, again, it's more like what Hans Moravec says, uh, if you guys know Hans. It's, uh, instead of saying that machines are taking over, it's this idea of humans in more potent form. right? Us augmenting ourselves with technology become something different. Uh, that's just one of the central ideas I'm, I'm very interested in. All right, let's talk about machine learning, why it's different, and how I got religion on it, just briefly. So this is a story. David Smith and I were at Lockheed Martin. Uh, we got called by these guys. Anybody recognize those folks? Well, I've got their names right there, so that's not fair. Um, that's, uh, uh, I'm out at Microsoft Research Labs in uh, San Francisco. That's Alex Kidman. He's the inventor of the Microsoft Kinect. Standing next to him is Jared Lanier, or actually I'm next to him, and then after that, Jared Lanier uh, is the guy who came up with the term virtual reality. Um, but they invited us out there because at Lockheed, we knew a little something about sensors, right? And they said, hey, we're trying to build this system that has to be able to track everything that's happening in the living room, right? Uh, and we've got to teach it this capability so they can track humans as they, because the human's going to become the, the uh, sort of uh, input device for gaming on our, on our uh, Xbox system. They shipped Xboxes all over the world. 
those Xboxes had about 100 megabytes of available leftover space on them. And the entire brain of the Kinect system had to fit in there. How many of you have a Kinect or had one? I know, no, they discontinued it apparently. But right away we figured out that the sensors they had were fine. Uh, but then they started showing us what they were doing with this new thing called machine learning. And this is 2009, 10 years ago. And we had always heard about machine learning, but again, we were a little jaded, like many of you are, saying, hey, we understand AI. You know what it is? AI is just code, right? The only things we call AI are things that aren't working yet. The minute it starts working, it's just code, right? It's, it's finite state machines, it's uh, hierarchical behavior trees, it's logic gates, that kind of thing. Uh, but this was weird and different, because again, 100 megabytes of available space, they had to teach it everything that's in a, in a living room. And that sounds simple to us, but those of us who have been working in computer science for a while know that that is computationally really complex. To teach a system like the difference between a chair and a table and a plant and all the different lighting conditions it might encounter. And the way they were solving that problem is not the old way of like, let me tell the computer what you know, this system, what a living room is, let me describe all the objects to it and how to parse it. But instead, let's give it a massive set of examples. Millions and millions of examples of stuff that's in living rooms in Europe, in Asia, difference between rural and urban environments. And uh, they ended up being successful with that, using a supercomputer, just feeding that in with some good libraries. And that's the central idea, that the algorithm up there is, now all we need is large data sets. We don't need to actually program stuff to, to make it, uh, to create this level of intelligence. So that was, that was weird and, and uh, sort of reprogrammed our minds. Uh, and then uh, 2010 is when we started seeing the deep mind activity. Anybody played with this stuff yet? Any of the machine learning libraries out of Google and elsewhere? I know we have an IBM Watson uh, uh, alumnus out here as well, but, but this got really interesting. Again, the difference was if I'm going to teach a system or create a system that understands how to play an Atari game, it's pretty easy for me to just like program that logic in. But the way they achieved it here, and that's me with Nolan Bushnell, by the way, the founder of Atari, and of Chuck E. Cheese, recall him, um, uh, is uh, just letting the system watch humans play and using machine libraries infer its own understanding of how to play pretty soon can outperform any human being at it. So that's about 2010. And, uh, shortly thereafter, many of us were still jaded about technology and said, you know, it's one thing for a, a machine to beat a human at chess or some of these other things, but, uh, but beating uh, a human at a game like Go, which requires a lot of deceit and strategy and, and is very complex and has as many positions as there are uh, atoms in the universe, whereas chess has enough, as many positions as there are, uh, you know, I, I guess uh, stars in the galaxy or something like that. Still very complex. We thought it would be at least 2027, 20, 2030 20, before this happened. Of course, it happened a lot faster. Back in 2017, I was doing a talk about this, watching this technology really rapidly advance, and we started looking at things like, you know, uh, how soon will it be before machines start learning to lie and to deceive us? And we were looking at other realms like playing poker or games like StarCraft that, again, require a lot of that human deceit and stuff, and said it's going to be a long time. But in 2017, I said, we think it's about to happen. And what happened? Anybody know about the poker stuff? Raise your hand if you heard about this. Good, you guys are learning a lot of new stuff here. So last year, just last year, Carnegie Mellon put together a pretty good little machine learning system, taught it how to play poker, put it up against the top Texas Hold'em players in the world. It took all their money. If you were paying attention, you should pay attention to this because that's, that's where it's starting to get weird, right? When a machine can, can do things like read the little nuances of human behavior, uh, learn how to deceive and, and uh, play a game like poker and win. And then just a couple of weeks ago, right, this happened with StarCraft, where the uh, uh, DeepMind system actually played the top teams in StarCraft and won. Now, it didn't win, it didn't completely wipe the table with them, but it prevailed. And that is, again, another bump in the night that we should all be paying attention to as we continue to slouch towards the singularity. Right? So I'm not saying that's happening anytime soon, and I'm, uh, I think there's a lot of complexity and, and things. So we'll talk about the Turing test and some of these issues as we get uh, towards the end of this talk. But it is getting weird. You should be paying attention. And we are able to use some of these newfound tools to model human behavior and make convincing humans even 
uh, more convincing. And again, the implications of that are pretty far reaching, whether you're working in games, whether you're working in simulations, or other areas that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, how do we actually model humans um, from data? So this is just arbitrarily every, and I, I did this very quickly talking about machine learning, and, and there's lots of different ways to, to apply machine learning. There's uh, doing it with text, which is what I'm mostly going to talk about here, mining text and data exhaust off of, off of people, and you can do it with imagery, uh, and that's of course why we have autonomous vehicles today, right? Um, I arbitrarily say that the age of AI started in 1958, just arbitrary, but up, in, uh, up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In 2009, I think, is when there was a watershed moment when everything changed and we started solving problems in a different way, at least I did, uh, by applying machine learning instead. In that first phase, with autonomous vehicles as one example, uh, we were, I call that the first phase of AI, which is a human being has to understand it first, and then sit down and tell the computer how to, how to you know, parse that, how to, how to uh, uh, parse the logic of that system. Like, how do human beings drive a car? And if you remember the early uh, attempts at DARPA to have autonomous vehicles in 2004, if any of you saw that, um, those vehicles were going across the desert uh, within 100 yards, losing their GPS signal, hitting a rock, having problems. It was because we were using old AI, that old brittle, logic system to try to do it. Uh, the breakthrough was a bunch of really good machine li learning libraries and massive sets of example videos of how to drive all the situations that the system might encounter when it's operating a vehicle. And of course what we learned is machines don't drive the way humans do, right? They've got different inputs and outputs, they, they've got uh, uh, GPS, they've got uh, LiDAR, they've got optic sensors, all sorts of things and uh, they drive differently. So that's another big important idea here is that the way humans perceive and sort of uh, move through the world is different from how machines do that. So this idea of machine intelligence is separate, but again in this talk we're going to focus on like how do we replicate human behavior with high fidelity using some of these same capabilities. I think we're in this phase right now which is data, any data scientists here? One, right? You guys are in high demand. I'll be surprised if you don't get out of here with, a, with an offer from somebody, probably from me. Um, but uh, we need those people um, to be able to take the data, get it into a form that we can feed it to our, our new machine learning library toys so that it can uh, make that big leap from big data to information, which is big data, data that's been organized, and that last big leap from information to intelligence, which is organized information that's been computed in some way. Right? That's the real power of the stuff. That's another talk, though. Um, and this last phase is where I think we are now, which, which is we're pairing up and looking for behavior scientists. And that's people that understand human behavior, how do humans make choices, uh, and then how do we actually use these other tools that we have to, uh, to harness that. So let's look at one phase, uh, or sort of one industry. Uh, customer marketing, sort of marketing research. In the United States alone, we spend about $3 billion a year just trying to understand what the heck do human beings want and how do I influence them to want the thing that I make, generally, right? Um, and the, the way they do it still is through focus groups and surveys. How many of you got one of those like needles and things in the mail where you, ask, you, know, you answer a couple of questions, they give you two bucks, you guys get those? Um, I usually throw those out. I keep the two bucks, but I throw them out because they're undervaluing my time, I think, to fill out that thing. So I don't know who fills those out or who attends these focus groups, but generally we understand that these things are biased, right? Netflix learned this a long time ago. If you want to understand human behavior, you don't ask people what they want to do with their time or their money, right? If I asked this whole group right now and said, you got two choices tonight, you can watch uh, Lawrence of Arabia tonight, or you can watch Hot Tub Time Machine, and I, everybody can hear, I can hear all of your answers. How many of you would say Lawrence of Arabia? How many of you say Hot Tub Time Machine? Right. So you guys are more honest than most people. Most people would say, like, if they think someone's watching, it's like, well, of course, Lawrence of Arabia, beautiful cinematography, outstanding acting. But anyhow, what do they do when they go home? Regardless of what they said in that survey or focus group, when they go home, what do they do? They watch Hot Tub Time Machine. And you can insert your own version of that story and make it more lurid if you want. But humans are different. There's a difference between what people say and even what they think about themselves and what they actually do. 
So this is one of the books that I read early on because we were getting into this um, and looking at what kind of data should I be using to model human behavior, right? There's a book out called Everybody Lies. And this sent, I'll just save you the time, it's not really well written, but there's a lot of interesting information in there. Most importantly, the general thesis is uh, exit polls, focus groups, and surveys did not predict Brexit. They did not predict Donald Trump. You know what did? Google search data and Amazon data. Like what people actually do with the, when they think nobody's watching, or even if they think somebody's watching, what do they do with their time, their attention, and their money? That's who they really are, not what they say. And this book is full of examples of that. And again, Netflix learned that. They did that, uh, remember that grand challenge for how do we improve our recommendation algorithm? And they gave away a million dollars. Um, does anybody know anything about the winner? Like what percentage improvement did they get uh, with that million dollar winner? Anybody know? It was like 10%. So really not that much of an improvement. Um, but again, what they learned is you don't ask people questions. You just harvest all that data about what they really do, watch them closely, <coughs> and then, uh, and then uh, build models off of that. Um, I learned this early on from Reid Hoffman. So Reid uh, uh, was a guy founded LinkedIn. He's one of the PayPal Mafia guys, right, with Elon Musk and those guys. Uh, he was an investor in my last company. He was starting LinkedIn. And I remember talking to him, because this was shortly after the dot-com bust in the two, 2001, 2002. And he's like, hey, you need to stop all this 3D simulation and gaming stuff and just come and work with me at LinkedIn because we're going to change the world. And I'm like, well, what, what's your business model? How are you going to make money? And it sounded to me like eyeballs, right? It's like, well, we're going to get people to network together and we're going to be able to see all that activity. He came back in about 2003 and we talked to him. I was like, Reed, you making money yet? No, not, still not making money. Still not earning a lot of money with this. Don't know what the real business model is, but... He said one thing, he said, you would not believe how much actionable information I see every day. And by actionable, I mean, you know, if everybody at Lockheed Martin started <coughs> updating, their, uh, updating their profile in one day, what does that mean? Is that a buy order or a sell order? I don't know, but it's definitely actionable. And that was the beginning of it. And it's a little upsetting to me, and I'll just, if I had a soapbox, I'd get up on it. But it's, a, it's amazing to me to, hear, to see that over the last 15 years, the billionaires we've made in this country from technology uh, has all been based on this central principle, right? Which is monetizing human attention. Like Herbert Simon said, uh, human attention is the, is the big currency of this century. So same thing that NBC, ABC, and CBS were doing in the last century, that's all we're doing now. We're not curing cancer and putting people on the moon. I hope we will, but with all that money and all that technology, we've been monetizing human attention, figuring out better ways to do that. I want to do more than that with this, although, as you'll see here in a second, this can be really used well for that, uh, for that uh, uh, capability. So here's another part of my background. Like when we were at Lockheed, we were building what's called constructive simulations. Now, there are programs called WarSim, JSIM. I don't know if you guys have heard of these things, but when you think about big you know, war games that are put on by the various commands and militaries around the world, we build these big constructive sims. Uh, and in these simulations, and by the way, billions of dollars of your tax money has gone to build these things like JSON. JSON has now been thrown away, and that was a new improvement to it called WarSim. But the whole idea is, you know, if you want to model all the activity or understand what's happening in Afghanistan, you don't say, you know, basically in Afghanistan you've got a couple of customer segmentation models. You got your Sunnis, you got your Shias, you got your Coptic Christians, you got your, you know, it's about seven basic types of people. That's how that's what we do with market research today, is we try to distill it down to these simplistic models. But when we were building these constructive sims, we have six million agent-based models representing six million different points of view and perspectives and values and that kind of thing, all created from intelligence data, and then we put that into a big simulation and then try out all whatever it is, like what if we built a school in, in this province for girls? What if we paved this road? What if we did this or that? And then you would get, you'd run tons and tons of simulations, get your sort of Monte Carlo distribution of potential outcomes and try to understand like what's likely to happen. And that's the, that's the tool set we use in, in the DoD. It's amazing to me that in market research and in other areas where people are trying to understand humans, they don't do this. So that's the opportunity. Take machine learning, take this simulation, which we do here, right? 
and uh, uh, here at this conference, and then put that together, and you get some really amazing things. So then uh, uh, one of my colleagues from IBM introduced me to these guys. Here's my uh, behavior scientist, two of the top uh, academic minds on the planet in this field, Dr. Richard Carson, UCAL San Diego, Dr. Jordan Louvier uh, uh, out of the uh, University of Washington. These two gentlemen are some of the most cited, they'll tell you, we're the most cited academic authors in this field of choice modeling. This thing called CCDIP, understanding human behavior, why do they make the choices they do, especially with their money. We took their models, we took our machine learning system, and said, let's start modeling human beings from it. Um, so one of the first tests we did with, this, with our new machine learning toy back in about 2014 is we said, let's go grab a whole bunch of OkCupid models. Here's, uh, I won't run through the whole experiment, but again, it's about can we understand just from what people, again, what they say, uh, but also what they write and that, that kind of thing, what their activity is, not what they actually say in a questionnaire. But what is their activity? Can I model a human being from that? So we ended up getting about 3 million OkCupid. This is back when the world was open and it was still kind of wild westy. All these doors are closed now, I hope. But we were able to get this sample set run our machine learning thing, and basically we got a Myers-Briggs-like model of all three million of these people. And then it's just about, I need an algorithm for what kind of profile matches well with another one. And I know today there's a lot of uh, online dating systems that are using AI and machine learning and recommendation matching, but back then they still hadn't done it. I decided not to go down this route because it just felt too icky to me. There's lots of, anytime I run into the ick factor, I usually pivot around it and go do something I find more meaningful because I can, but this was a really interesting uh, thing that we did. Uh, one of the first things after that that I did is this, and this is kind of timely and I brought this guy back up because this was I think probably uh, 17 months ago, pause, maybe not. but what we did, again, using machine learning, is I had our system read everything Victor Hugo ever wrote. Turns out he wrote a lot more poetry than he did novels like The Hunchback of Notre Dame. All of his uh, personal correspondence and that sort of thing, and then it actually built an interest graph of him and a sentiment graph. I released him on the net, and every day I could go visit him and see, like, what's he interested in today? How does he feel about it? Now, of course, he's been very active over the last couple of days. Uh, he's been very obsessed with what happened with uh, Notre Dame because, but, uh, but so it's interesting to see that. But I can do that with anybody if I have enough data, and that's the key, right? Uh, we did it with people like George Washington. And by the way, Victor Hugo has been out for I think 23 months now, so almost two years. Um, and again, I could visit him every day. But what's interesting is we left one version of him that just the original one that was birthed that day, and the one that exists today has a different interest graph than the one here. So he has, so Marshall McLuhan, you could say, and I haven't written this up or anything yet, but you could say Marshall McLuhan's right, right? That we are affected by the media we consume. That he's been affected by the things that he's written, uh, read over the last uh, uh, couple of years. Uh, so I've got George Washington, Leonardo da Vinci, Martin Luther King, anybody. I just need lots and lots of text, right? I need that in order to make these models. And if you're interested in how we actually construct these, again, I can start with basic demographics. Uh, then start adding, you know, I can get that interest graph pretty quickly, but if I'm going to climb up this ladder, and I never say we can know anybody 100%. I'm never going to be able to predict with 100% accuracy what any of you are going to do. But if I have enough data exhaust from you, if you've got LinkedIn, you're posting on Twitter, and you're, uh, and especially if I, got, if I can read your emails, uh, I can actually construct a pretty good model of you. So now, you know, Gartner uh, ended up giving us an award last year, recognizing this as a really unique capability that's totally disrupting the three billion dollar a year market research market. Where again, what companies are doing is just making you know, seven or eight uh, segmentation models of who they think their customers are, and then it ends up being on a piece of paper that they pull out anytime they do a new marketing campaign or anytime they want to create a new product. And we look at that from our simulation world and say, that's ridiculous. Why don't you have a model for all 126 million households in the US? And uh, why aren't you running simulations around this for everything you do? Um, there's a good answer to that. I'll get to that in a second. But getting, climbing up this ladder 
if I have actually information, not just about you know, what you say on your Facebook profile and your LinkedIn and, and other media types or even what you've written, but if I can climb up a little bit further and say, what do you actually do with your money when you walk in the store? And that's why we went with Nielsen as well. Nielsen has watch data and purchase data. From that, you can derive patterns and you can get really interesting models of who people really actually are. Then you put those in a sim and you can test ideas in ways we've never been able to do before. Now, are, how many of you are concerned already? Who should be, right? Because how many of us are putting data out there? How many, how many, how many of us are buying on Amazon? Again, like I said, if I, the richest data sets beyond Nielsen, and I haven't been able to get these data sets yet, I want Google and Amazon. If I have that, I can build really rich, deep models of every single household in the United States and begin to predict with pretty good accuracy what people are going to do. How about um, things like um, uh, location services on your phone? How many of you have location services on your phone on right now? How many of you know whether you have it on or not? <laughs> right? Go and look at that carefully, because even if you have one app that you forgot to turn lo location services off, I, I can get rich, very cheap, very, very rich data on you personally. Right? I know how long you slept last night, where you went, which places you stayed at and for how long, where you're shopping. I pair that together and fuse that with Nielsen, with demographic census data, with Google search data, and with other data. And I, again, it's a pretty darn complete model and very scary. Um, and we, most of us don't really understand how much data we're giving away. So how do, we, how do we turn the tables on that? Let's talk about that in a second. So I talk, you saw this ability to create a person, a model of a person, release them on the net, and now I can watch what they do. Like, what are they interested in? I let them read the news, and they can read hundreds of thousands of articles every day and, and tell me, give me scores for what they're interested in. The next step is, what if I could write to them and have them tell me how interested they are in what I write? How useful could that be? How useful would that be in a company to know, like, hey, if I've got a new, I always use the example of the United CEO, you know, if you're looking for somebody who's tone deaf, right? <laughs> when, when he had some of those issues they've had over the last couple of years, how does he talk to the public about, and, and to his own employees about what's happening? And clearly he doesn't have a simulator to test those ideas, to see those perspectives and empathize with them. Otherwise he wouldn't say the things that he does. Uh, so that's very useful. But certainly, if you're trying to achieve deeper empathy with your customers, even if your customers are your own game players, right, for those of you making games, what if you could build a synthetic population of who those people are and test the things on them previously? Instead of doing A and B testing with like a couple of groups that are maybe paid people who are doing it and know they're, again, it's no different than a business group. <coughs> Do on this, create on this synthetic population of your customers and test it there, and you get more interesting, accurate uh, uh, results from that. Assuming that your data was good, right? That's the big thing in, in any of these constructive sims is the, the, the quality of the data that goes into modeling these people and the robustness and how many different sources do you have. That validation and verification, or VMV as the DOD call, the Department of Defense calls it, is critical step. But now we can do that, right? We can write to them. And these are the tools that we're offering to a lot of companies today. Is this better and hopefully it's being used for good to achieve deeper empathy with their customers and not just coerce them. But we'll talk about co coercion here in a second. So the next natural step is this, right? This is from our, we did a Douglas Adams game in, what year was that? 1997. Anybody play Starship Titanic? All right, yes. I still have a ball cap. Fantastic, Starship awesome. Titanic. So Douglas Adams would come here to North Carolina and we worked with him on this game. And, we created this thing called, we called it Velocitext. Um, he called it Spooky Talk because even though our natural language processing library that we had back then had, I think, the full dictionary was something like 700 words or something like that, even with that crude capability, we were able to achieve some interesting interactions with the game characters where you could just talk to them and they would jive back at you and talk back to you. And it, it created some interesting interactions. Um, how many of you are using NLP? And, interactions with characters in your games today? Not many. It's hard, right? I mean, it's hard to make it satisfying, but if you do make it satisfying, I think we're, we're about to, using tools like machine learning, I think we're about to bust through this. And yes, I, I, this is artwork that we created for that, and I always thought it was interesting that it looked just like that character in that movie scene. That's what that's all about. Uh, here's another natural language uh, example. 
This is a, uh, something we did that we trained a system on contract law, so it can read any contract. We paired that up with a thing called BERT, which you can get from Google, um, that's been trained on all of Wikipedia, so it understands natural language conversations in English. And so now, a human being using that can just, without, I don't need to read my contracts anymore, I don't need to hire a lawyer. I have my system read that, and then I ask it questions, and it answers my questions. So I know it's probably hard to read here, but it doesn't matter how poor your grammar is, or what kind of language you use, or how you phrase your question, the system always knows how to answer that question with very, very high fidelity. So we're at this, you know, when we talk about automation, a lot of people are concerned about things like checkout lines and that, kind of, that sort of thing. But this whole field of analysis uh, of uh, data sets with human, humans reading a lot of content or looking at a lot of data and, uh, and applying judgment to it, that is being automated with great effect. But I'm just showing you that the, uh, the, the I, I look at this as two separate tech pieces that are going into a tech stack of natural language uh, chatbot capability that really understands how to, you know, when someone talks to it, and then something that's been deeply trained on a very constrained, specific area of expertise like tax code or revenue recognition rules or the architecture of building codes or whatever it is. That's the secret of machine learning is bound in context and training it. All right, so NLP is happening. This is something that I think is more accessible today. Some of the things we're doing in higher education is, gosh, what if you could uh, uh, pull people from history and, that have been modeled using this capability and then try to get some guidance from them as mentors about decisions you have to make. Or we're looking at things like students being able to talk to people from history and see, you know, na have natural language conversations with them. Carnegie Mellon's done a lot of great work in that field and others, but I mean, I think we're pretty much over the hump there where we can make very convincing interactions with these models of, uh, of humans made from data. That's generally where I think we are today in 2019. Now, is it really Winston Churchill? Is it really uh, you know, uh, Isaac Newton? No, it's a model built upon whatever data was used to actually create that person. Like I said, the real artifice, the real effort today is like making sure that the data that goes into these models is as accurate and validated and verified as possible and true. Um, and we can climb up that ladder to the 80%. So this is a big sort of heart tugging story here. Um, Ray Kurzweil uh, has always talked about this interest in resurrecting his father. So when my dad died in 2017, I mean, I thought about it only for maybe two days. I think my daughter's sitting back here, so it's her grandfather. Uh, and I had to do it. The problem with my dad, though, was he, he, led, he led a really interesting life. He died at the age of 86. Um, but he was not on LinkedIn. He was not on Facebook. He had no data exhaust to speak of. So I had to do what Ray Kurzweil was trying to do with his dad, which is take all of his personal, personal correspondence, um, scan all that stuff in, scan in his military records, uh, and then hand build from there, to be honest, the way we would hand build characters in a game, right? I, I know things that he was interested in that he may not have talked about in the correspondence that I was able to scan. The biggest problem with that project for me was the OCR part of it. OCR is still terrible, like, because, you know, you might look at a PDF and say, well, look, there's text in that PDF. No, it's just an image of something, and that's not text. It has to be converted to text, and that's an awful, still a really awful, difficult thing to do. So that was the biggest thing. But once I get it into the massive sort of word cloud uh, of uh, stuff about him, I can create the interest graph pretty quickly, and then I can create that sentiment model, especially if I have stuff that is written. And when you just interest and sentiment gets you to something that's pretty satisfying about you know, how do you model a person. Um, and again, going above that, if I have a lot of information about choices that he's made when he, when he actually had choices, and we can get into some deep philosophical uh, discussions about that because even with Dr. Louvier and Dr. Carson, I say, look at all this rich data I have from Nielsen and from these other purchase behaviors and location services and all that put together. I've got some rich models. I can tell you the body mass index of every household in the United States. I can tell you a lot about everybody here. Um, but then, he, then they would say things like, well, you don't know when that person walked into the grocery store the things they looked at and decided not to buy. You only know the trend, you only know the transactions, right? So we don't know that sort of, but when people shop online at Amazon, do I know that? Yeah. 
So uh, again, is it possible to build satisfying models? Yeah. So let's talk about the coercion part. We have time, yes. So let's talk about coercion. This is very interesting. So again, everybody knows what Cambridge Analytica was, right? Is, was, hopefully it's past tense now. Um, but let's look about something a little more benign, right? How many of you have eaten kale in the last year? A lot of people, right? How many of you were eating kale six years ago? Probably not many, a few? Okay, cool. Um, who was the biggest buyer of kale six years ago? Pizza Hut. Yeah, it was just to put those little, because they stayed green a long time. Nobody was, not many people in the US were eating um, kale six years ago. So what happened was this, the kale growers hired this one PR firm who had demonstrated the use of some of these technologies we've been talking about. How do you model, how do you uh, identify human populations that might be susceptible to your message? How do you figure out how to model them, put them into a sim, and start test messaging? Um, and again, one of the central ideas here is if I want to make a Democrat or Republican, a Trump voter, a Bernie voter, um, or take someone who's fine with uh, uh, white Zinfandel wine and make them a uh, someone who's demanding Cabernet Sauvignon that's been 20 years old, that, it, that doesn't happen with a message. It happens with all these micro-messages, right? I've got to get them to accept uh, sort of a pathway along belief systems. Accept this truth, then that one, then that one, then that one, and I can move someone to that, to that new perspective. Again, Cambridge Analytica proved it in a negative way, I think. We proved it here as well. They developed an entire market for something that didn't exist six years ago in a short amount of time by identifying, again, there's this whole concept uh, Dr. Carson has of base and swing. Don't worry about the base. You can't change somebody who's already in that camp that's deeply entrenched. But there's a group in the middle who's susceptible, so now I can identify them. I can figure out who are their influencers. They like Gwyneth Paltrow. They like whoever. I get them to deliver the message, those micro messages for me, and it doesn't take much to nudge them from this entrenched, slightly entrenched position to a completely new one where now, you know, iceberg lettuce is fine, as I like to say here in the upper quadrant. There's competing messages out there. All of a sudden they're demanding, you know, massaged kale with a car neutral carbon footprint at 15 bucks a plate. That happened in a very short amount of time through this influence model. In this case, I think it's a useful. Uh, healthy thing, but can it be used for bad things? Yeah. We are susceptible to manipulation through media. That's a problem, right? But it's also an opportunity because these powerful tools are out there. How many, how many of you think any of you have been manipulated in the last? Thank you for raising your hand because it happens. And we've all, I've been taken by news that was only half true, and I knew the half truth, so I was like, well, maybe the rest of it's true because I know the half of it is true. And it turned out I was being I was being dragged along that micro messaging thing by some troll, probably. Uh, here's another great example. Uh, 2014, you guys know your history. You know there was a thing that happened in the Ukraine where they deposed a leader. How many of you think that was a revolution? And how many first of all, how many think it was a revolution? How many think it was a coup? Western driven coup. All right. Well not everybody raised their hands again again, medication or whatever. You guys are on. But this was a big deal because I, shortly thereafter, my wife was here a minute ago. I married an Italian woman. And we go frequently to, to travel in Italy and I'll speak at conferences over there. And while there, I started asking people this question. And pretty much everybody said, oh, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a uh, coup driven by Western you know, powers, but it was a useful thing that it happened and here's why, et cetera, et cetera. And I, when I started asking about what media do you consume, they all were, almost all of these people in Italy, even though they're, they're intelligent uh, people at universities, they all have that Russian satellite television show coming into their, their CNN is, is coming out of Russia, right? And it's speaking in Italian and the whole thing, but that's where they're getting their news and they're being manipulated you know, along that path. So we have to ask the questions like, man, yeah, but that Russia's using propaganda. We don't want to be that guy or that country that does that. Should we be, can we ignore this? Can we safely ignore this, this, uh, this manipulation of the truth around the world? No, we can't. We, we found out that that's a very delicate, very difficult thing to deal with. So 2017, I was on a panel at a big military conference. Uh, called Narratives and in Information Warfare. This was December 2017, so we're still pretty right from, or pretty new from the 2016 election. Um, 
But again, uh, there's people here from the RAND Corporation, Department of Defense, Joint Information Operations Warfare Center. But we did a big talk and panel about discussing, you know, what should we do? And is there really a problem? And we figured out pretty quickly, yeah, there's a huge, huge problem. Um, on everything from like, when we had, uh, there's a thing over there about, um, that's Cambridge Analytica, I don't have the other thing I think, but there's this thing about net neutrality, right? It's like, who are these people who are arguing against net neutrality? It turns out to be Russian trolls, a bunch of other of our adversaries around the world, trying to undermine openness of the internet, and th there's, a, there's a lot of data exactly on, well I do have it down here, it's, uh, we received 400,000, pre-internet regulation comments from the same mail address out of, out of Russia, right? So it's happening. There's an adversary. This, there is a warfare that's happening. So likely enough, one of the things that we did, not likely, if you may not know this, but we actually created a new directorate that is out there trying to fight this war. Just be aware of it as those of you who are U.S. citizens, that's happening. It's out there, and we're trying to fight it because it is a very real thing. This is potent capability, potent technology and it's happening fast. Uh, let's talk about the Turing test. All right, so there's lots of ways to, pat, to talk about the Turing test. There's the Chinese room, there's all sorts of things. And, and again, um, you know, the question keeps, uh, that we keep asking is, has it yet been passed? Um, and it started, I think, when was that day? Like 1950s or something, when Alan Turing first posed this idea. It's like, at what point, it's, it's the point at which uh, you interact with a system of some kind via chat. They call it the Chinese room because you can't see the person, obviously. If you could see it, you would know that it's not a person. But through some medium like the computer or text, can, can the thing, can you interact with something to the point where uh, you can't tell if it's a human or not, or, or you're convinced that it is a human, right? And there's several variations of this, but one is, uh, um, the people who are really deeply looking at this think that you should not let the people participating in it know that there's a computer, poss there possibly will be a computer playing in that test. If they think it might be a human, they're more easily convinced that. So I think that's a lower threshold. Um, there's, a, there's this thing called the Loebner Prize, L-O-E-B-N-E-R, that um, I think is the more uh, scientific view of this problem. And they've got a bronze, silver, and gold medal that they give away. They give away bronze medals every year. The bronze medal is for the most um, convincing chatbot that uh, seems to approach the, the appearance of intelligence. But they've never given a silver or a gold. So that's kind of what I use as my measurement of it. But can they get convincing? Can you tell sometimes when you're actually talking to a person or if you're talking to a bot? It's getting a little more difficult to tell. Um, but any opinions on that? I'll open it up if you guys have any opinions on that. I think one of the most fascinating things relating to the Turing test was a book that I read. I can't remember the author's name. But the title of the book was The Most Human Human. And he wanted to be one of the human people answering questions just like the, the computers were. And it got him to thinking, how do I answer questions? What does it mean for me to answer like a human? Whereas, of course, the, the computer programmers were trying to say, we're also trying to answer like a human. So what are they even trying to do? What does that look like? To be, and it's a fascinating insight into the huge fan, you know, delta of what does it mean to, be, to answer like a human? Because if you're thinking, you know, how many people got in this room, 80? 60, you know, how, we're all going to answer completely differently in a chat room, you know, and so what is it that, yeah, if you're, if you're trying to create a, a Turing test bot just in, in the, the, the vanilla version of, you know, the, the text chat room, what, what, are we, what are we shooting for? Which one of us are we going to be trying to, to emulate? Right. I mean, a lot of people bring up examples of Siri and Alexa. If it, I mean, I, we've looked deeply into that, and to me, Siri and Alexa are both just massive lookup tables. They're not anything that we would call, I wouldn't call it open-ended machine learning or AI. But of course, the problem they have is they're trying to be really, really broad. Uh, remember what I said earlier, the secret, the big secret IBM has learned with Watson that we learned with our system is you don't try to say, I'm going to solve the semantic web problem in all human knowledge. 
You try to get it down to like, I'm going to build a system that's got 4,000 nodes in its brain that deeply understands this one air, confined area of expertise. Whatever it happens to be, the more you can confine it, the more satisfying that thing becomes, and the deeper that interaction becomes, and the better it is. Um, for example, there's a lot of scheduling bots out there, and I think that is somewhat of a confined area because there's only so many things you can schedule. Uh, but Google had this, anybody see this uh, duplex uh, AI demo that Google did? They claimed, like, hey, we passed the Turing test. And a lot of us immediately started assaulting it, say, wait a second, wait a second, that was an awesome demo on stage, but let's, you know, open it up a little bit and let us try it. And of course, when you start trying it, you realize that they pretty much faked it with a look on table. That's the disconcerting thing. For a minute there, we thought, hey, something just passed the Turing test. And they claimed it, and the BBC reported it, and all this stuff, and then, and then you didn't see a lot of reports about the fact that it didn't. It was sort of on the, just on a slash dot, and you know, places like that where we're all sort of, sort of screaming about how it didn't actually do it. So my, my view is we have not yet passed the Turing test. We can do some convincing things, but are those sub-Turing test capabilities useful? Absolutely. Um, I just did a tour through South America where I spoke in Buenos Aires and I went to Medellin, Colombia. By the way, despite all the press you hear about Medellin, go there, it's awesome. They're doing a great job with the city. Um, but one of the things about South American culture, I think, is this idea, like what I did with my dad just like really resonated there. This idea of the veneration of your ancestors and actually being able to even consult with them and say, look, I've got a big decision coming up, a new job I want, or think about marrying this person or this big life event, uh, and being able to actually burn a candle and actually try to talk to your ancestors who are no longer with you is a big thing. So this idea of being able to construct them in some way and at least do that Likert scale approach, like I'm thinking about doing this, do you strongly agree or disagree? Can we do it? Yes. Should we do it? I don't know. Everyone, like, I've got a lot of stuff from down there saying, do it, do it, make it into a company. Why haven't you done it yet? Like, because again, it's kind of like the dating thing. It's like I can't, like, I like solving business problems and like turning a 10x return into a, a, a customer that I work for. This idea of building something that has this deep impact personally on people's lives where I'm uncertain of the, you know, how valid is it really. It's really not my thing, but I think it's a rich area to explore, and so maybe one of you will get into that area uh, and, and build something like that. Uh, so generally, that's the, that's the whole thing. I'd love to hear questions you guys have. Um, anybody thinking about, because I, I really think there's an interesting opportunity to build more robust characters to interact with in like massive multiplayer online games and stuff like that, all driven from this. What if you could really be Leonardo da Vinci in you know, Warcraft or whatever the MMOG that you sure is. I don't have enough time to play them anymore, but, uh, but I used to. So questions? Yes, sir. Uh, you were mentioning about how the media is being manipulated and also there's a lot of internet manipulation going on. Have you or somebody else thought about taking all media sources and putting it into a learning computer and trying to distill out what the real story is? So that, did everybody hear that? Is anybody, or me, is anybody looking at taking all the sort of news stories especially and trying to discern you know, what's real, what isn't, um, what's reliable, what isn't? Um, yeah, I think that is a central problem of our time. In fact, that is, and I do think that is a problem that is reducible to the kinds of systems we're talking to here. Maybe even the old AI kind of approach. Um, because there, there is this set of algorithms called the truth triad, and I, don't ask me to think to bring them up right now, but um, Google, I think, has, Google, people like Google and Facebook have access to those kinds of things. The fact that they're not doing it is because it's inconsistent with their business model. And really, it's about incentives. That's how everything happens in the world. Is like if you can't figure out a business way to, and that's why if you saw in the uh, the thing that I wrote, uh, the little brief that I wrote about this talk, I said pre-reading, go read the Intention Economy. How many of you read the Intention Economy by Doc Searle, the guy who writes Linux Journal, who writes Linux Journal? Uh, please read that. If not, before that, he did something called the Clue Train Manifesto. How many of you are familiar with that? some of us old guys. Man, so the Clue Train Manifesto was written the day the graphical internet was born. 
which is about 1993, right? And it said, finally, you know, CBS, ABC, NBC, they, we've had this broadcast media manipulating us into what's real and what's true, and, and we just, we have no choice but to ingest it and then try to make up our minds about what's true. We're being manipulated by a few media strands. Now all of us are publishers, and now it's going to open it up, and the power is swinging back to the individuals. The internet's going to be this incredibly empowering thing for individuals. And is that what's happening? What did I just say? No, the, all the billionaires we're making now are off of monetizing human attention and manipulating people. Uh, the way we were doing it, it's all c consolidating more back to this broadcast medium. But can you arrive at truth and validity and trust using some of the algorithms we're talking about? And actually, <coughs> people can learn to trust those systems. Yes, we can. What's the business model? And that's the problem with, with Doc Searle's book, uh, where you know instead of you getting bombarded with ads all day long everywhere you go, what if you could have a bunch of bots that you can, can be trained on your values and your interests and know that, yeah, I like Hugo Boss jackets, and I'm going to have a bot that just puts out an RFP on the net when I'm in buying mode. But if I'm not in buying mode, I don't see ads, right? But when I am, I'll put it out there, uh, and uh, I'll say, look, anytime you have a 40 regular blazer from Hugo Boss that's under 500 bucks, contact my bot. My bot can negotiate that with you. And then these sell for like 800 bucks, so <coughs> most of the time he doesn't hear anything. But when he does, he calls me and says, hey, I got a deal for you, right? And you could have a whole bunch of these specialized bots out there representing your interests. Now, would you pay for it? That's the problem, right? Most people don't even think about, you are paying for all this stuff today with your personal information, with your data. Would you pay a couple dollars a month to have that kind of relationship with the vendors out there not be bombarded with ads all the time? That, that's one of the sort of, uh, I think, key issues today. Uh, all the way in the back. Um, you read a lot about uh, bias in machine learning. I'm wondering if you have any takes on how to ensure that the data sets and training programs don't have the issue of biases with the people models. Yeah, biases in machine learning systems and models, right? Critical problem. My friend, also an investor in my last company, Joey Chiita, who's the director of the MIT Media Lab now, um, has a whole initiative on this issue of the bias, you know, and how, how are these things making, making decisions, especially when we get into autonomous vehicles, right? How do they choose between the, you know, the old lady and the dog, <laughs> when, if they're going to hit one, that, those kinds of problems. Um, and yeah, that's one of, if you see any of the talks that I do, where I talk about the other systems we're developing in machine learning, is, and again, I'm jaded on this, and, and I've talked about the fact that AI is just, once, it, once we implement it, it's just code, you know, that's doing something. Machine learning is different. It really is because it's about inference from raw data sets and then some kind of output that it's been trained on. Uh, that's why that validation and verification is incredibly important on the front end. And again, we know that in the simulation industry, in modeling and simulation in the Department of Defense. But the other important thing, and in my talks and in, with my customers, I, we finally made this point with Tanjo where I said, I, I cannot, with good conscience, build machine learning systems that are black boxes and sell them to people or sell it as a service. I, don't, I think if you understand how this stuff works, that makes no sense whatsoever. So when I hear about people who are lobbying their data off to, I won't mention all the names, but the usual list of suspects. I'm like, yeah, but they're doing it for nearly free and it's awesome. It's like, it's not free, dude. You just paid for it with your data, right? So I think it's two things, right? This, if you don't remember anything else on this talk is machine learning is powerful and it's intimate. So if you're gonna use it in your company, you need full access to it, full traceability, all the way down to the source code level. Like, how is this thing making its discernment, it's judgment. And if you don't have that, don't use that system. That's what I would say about it. And again, most people are still not, they're wrestling with it, they're getting a lot of confusing messages out there, and I see people signing up for software as a service with this stuff, but that makes no sense. We shouldn't be giving our data to Facebook, we shouldn't be giving it to LinkedIn and all these other guys, but uh, it's, even, it's even more of a deep problem with machine learning systems. So traceability is where the capital T is incredibly important.
Um, picking up a couple of strings left on the floor and tying them together here, you touched briefly at the end of your lecture on possibly being able to use better AI, machine learning, and stuff like that in games. And of course, that's you know our environment here is it's a game conference. Um, <clears throat> but then also, just in your recent answer, you talked about wariness of black box systems. And of course, that's one of the pushbacks in using any sort of you know machine learning or any sort of you know uh, autonomous sort of thing for the game industry as far as characters go especially is because if your designer says yeah hey this is really cool what you've trained up but in this one situation can you make the character do this a little more often well uh no mm -hmm. i mean in four hours i'm talking about giving up a little bit of authorial control and letting ai take more of that role yeah but we still have to be able to, you know, to do that, and that's one of the drawbacks of machine learning. So a multi-part question is, where do you see this kind of stuff taking a place in the game industry, and yet keeping as necessary, and not maybe not entirely, but keeping some of that authorial uh, control for designers and writers or whomever to be able to make the experience that they want to rather than, well, let's just see what comes out of this game. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and a very, and it is a critical, crucial, obvious um, issue with this tech or the approach that I was talking about here. So, uh, yeah, I think, um, uh, first of all, you can't lose sight of what the utility function of a game is. So in machine learning, we have this concept of utility function. You can approach it two ways, right? Utility function is where you give it a goal. And the most fun thing to do with machine learning is dump all the data in the top and, and have it, I call it the new scientific method, right? Which is dump all the data in and have it figure out every hypothesis that might be true. And we do that a lot as an exercise because you end up having new insights. But if you're building a game using this, the utility function is it has to be entertaining. And not just be, oh, it's, but this is a really true valid ver you know, version of Leonardo da Vinci. Well then, what if he ends up not being interesting, or you know doesn't interact with, doesn't want to play, <laughs> you know? Well, that's a problem. So I think in the end, there's a construct here of how do you build these characters? Well, they could be either 100% data derived, they could be a hybrid, hybrid, or they can be the old way we made game characters, which is we hand construct them, right? But I think that hybrid, there's a lot of rich, bored mind in that area of hybrid. Like let me let me take a bunch of data around a real person around Vladimir Putin, right, and pull him into this thing about what would he actually really do, and then let me tune it for gameplay. I think that's the, that's, that's where the balance needs to be. But you're right, that is, that's definitely an issue. But well, and then the making other games issue. because, look, the tech is cool, never worked. Well, and then the other issue, you talked about, you know, DeepMind and, and the, the poker box and everything, and the, the problem with that is we're actually not trying to win. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, Soren Johnson, 2008. The goal of the AI is to just barely lose. That's right. It's uh, it's the intensity curve, right? If you yep. talk to Nolan Bush now, and like he, they they had a bunch of data coming out of the back of their Pac-Man machines and stuff like that. I mean, uh, 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 analog data on these punch on these uh, streams of uh, cards that they pull out and look at and see like how do we get people to put that next quarter in. And it has to be just a little bit, like they can lose, but they, they can't be just, just destroyed or they won't play the next time. So it's about intensity curves. There's a whole theory of gameplay around that. That's, what, that's how you create addiction, and that's what you want to, again, uh, solve for. I remember, uh, for those of you, did anybody play uh, Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon? So that was the first game ever. And there's one that we built, right, that where we were testing it, and I was surprised and concerned by the AI because it was outflanking us. And you know, again, we're testers in there trying to play it, and it was just killing us. And you don't even know how you got killed. And it's because the AI was just too damn good. And of course, we found out later it was cheating. <laughs> so no, uh, we don't. So do we that. had to dial it back so that because otherwise that's no fun at all, right? Because the AI, AI knows the terrain; they're in it all day long. It's like the Wreck-It Ralph movie or something. And they will kill you every single time if you program them that way. We have that same problem with adversaries in big, massive uh, uh, war games that we build. You can't make, because you could construct adversaries that are just impossible to defeat, because they don't make mistakes, right? 
And again, there's a whole um, you know, discussion about uh, Skynet around that. But uh, other questions? You had one earlier. Did we already cover yours? I was just going to ask, with like your animated personas, what kind of compute power today is it taking to do stuff like that? I mean, where do you see that going? Well, first of all, con there's constructing them and then there's uh, hosting them. Those are two different things. Constructing them takes a lot of, uh, but, but today that's, what, that's why we're able to do a lot of this stuff. We do all this, we have this like weird uh, system we, we put together that's AWS, uh, Cloud66, and uh, DigitalOcean combined together that where each of them have their own strengths so we break out the compute tasks among them and it can sort of load balance not only with each uh, system but among the three of them. There's a long, longer architecture discussion there but but building that initial version can take you know, a day or a half a day to construct a person if I've got enough data on them. And when I say enough data, there are people that say, oh, I just need 10,000 information objects. Um, we very often say 50,000, but my data scientists are happiest when there's millions and millions, right? And that takes some, like we had a system, we trained one of our systems once on every single legal opinion in the United States history since 1797. And you can do that today, that's what's cool and fun. And, but it takes like eight days to like build its brain, and then there's some human supervision around tuning it that happens afterwards. But once, like if I create uh, Victor Hugo, the reason I've kept him there for as long as I have is, it's sort of not uh, a trivial amount of money to host him. Uh, and he's reading hundreds of thousands of articles every day and reporting on like what he thinks is interesting, giving me a sentiment index. Like, what's weird, I, I didn't really, I should have talked about this more deeply, but a lot of the stuff that he's read over the last couple of days, he's tended towards more, more of the negative, gloomy reporting on the, on the Notre Dame Cathedral than on like the more positive things, which is like, hey, all the stone structure didn't burn down, and we've got all these models built in Assassin's Creed and all this stuff, and we can rebuild it really quickly. He wasn't as interested in those as he is in the doom and gloom part of it. I'm not really sure why that is. But, uh, but anyway, hosting them is not, not expensive at all. But like we, we're building models of consumer behavior off of data from Nielsen and stuff like that. And it's roughly, you know, 700 bucks or something like that to do it for a client. And then it's a hosting fee of a couple hundred bucks a month to host it forever. And you get all these rich, deep interactions. That's why we're having the biggest problem with market research people because they'll go and spend $1.5 million and get, um, you know, 10 uh, segmentation models of like, here are my customers. Here's iPhone Mom, Joey Gearhead. You know, they have these like really aggregate, high level models of who people are. And we're like, that's not who people are. You know, they're a lot more complicated than that. So, but I'll, I'll go back to what I said earlier. When I said, why don't you have 126 million models of consumers? And there's a very good answer to that. So we did this one project with a chicken company, right? And the problem they had is they were doing focus groups and surveys and they had all these models of like how people buy chicken in the United States. Like there's a person who only buys the organic. There's people that are fine with like frozen chicken chunks and don't care where it comes from, you know? There's a spectrum of people in between. Um, but when they were answering in focus groups and surveys, they were trying to figure out like how much in North Carolina how much of the uh, grocer shelf do we need to stock with organic stuff at a higher price point versus the cheaper stuff that's antibiotic free or you know these other products? And if you took the focus group and survey data, it would be like 70% of the shelves need to be stocked with healthy, organic, yada yada. But you take the Nielsen data and look at it, it's like no. They say that, but what they actually do is the opposite. Like they look at that organic, it's like 15 bucks. Six dollars. Hmm, my family would be fine. It's antibiotic free after all. It says right there on the package, and they buy that. Um, so, uh, but it turns out that there are not 126 million meaningfully different ways to buy chicken. By the way, you know what the number is? Two. Forty-two. We arbitrarily stop. I mean, we do that all the time because again, we'll run it through the system, and it'll come up with all those pattern. It'll it'll do the clustering, right? Of, patterns of behavior around buying chicken in different areas from di based on different demographics and all that stuff. But there's, we, we just cut it off our, just for fun at 42. It's like, you don't need, but, but it's not five, right? It's 42. And they're hierarchically organized. So there's iPhone mom, who controls 85% of the household spending. But then underneath iPhone mom, there's these subcategories that are different based on education level, income level, 
uh, where they live, are they rural versus urban, and all those sorts of things. And that's the deeper, better model for how to understand your customers than the six or seven that you get from spending $1.5 million with McKinsey. All right, do we have time for it? Yeah. So as a student, uh, you know, I think a lot of students are interested in machine learning and stuff. And, you know, I've messed around with it. You know, I can like, tell different flowers apart and stuff. But like, do you have any advice on like what the next step is for me if I wanted to pursue a career in machine learning? Yeah, I mean, the, the data science part of it is in high demand. We get headhunted all the time. I've got to like turn off all the incoming phone calls into my office. Because um, Silicon Valley is paying like 300 grand, 400 grand for, for data scientists. I don't think that's going to be forever, but um, I would think that first critical step, because the programming of it is one thing, right, of the system. The uh, getting the data into a way that where you can train a system reliably on it, that is a art and skill that is in high demand that's hard to find. And it's just understanding, it's like deeply understanding statistics, working with tools like R and Python. So if you've got a little bit of like, I understand how databases work and relational databases and graph, graph databases especially, and then R and Python for a little bit of programming, that is the killer skill that we cannot find enough of right now. So head in that direction, you'll be good, I think, for some period of time. All right, so this has been fun, guys. we run over a little bit. I'll be down. I've got a booth for another company I have down the stairs called Ultisim. If you want to chat more, it has this logo on it. it does some of our can continue to do our simulation learning stuff. But uh, I hope I gave you all something to think about, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with it. Thank you.